He is probably the most iconic character in all of Tolkien's works, Gollum, the miserable creature that desperately wants his precious ring back. Today on Council of the Rings, we will cover the full story of Gollum, and this is of course in honour of the upcoming Gollum game, set to release May 25th. Gollum's story begins around 2430, which is the estimated date of his birth, according to Robert Foster in The Complete Guide to Middle-earth. Gollum was a store hobbit, one of the three breeds of hobbits we know of. The stores lived around the Gladden Fields at the time, and it was a time of peace Gollum was born in, but he was born during the watchful peace where Sauron still hid in the east. His grandmother was the matriarch of the store hobbits, both stern and wise, and she ruled them according to the strange customs of the stores. Unlike other hobbits, the stores weren't afraid of water, and would often go boating on the Gladden and Anduin River, though few of them could actually swim. They were also heavier and broader in build, and could even grow facial hair. They were the most man-like of the hobbits, but still quite different to the men living in the Vales of Anduin. Now Gollum isn't his real name, nor is it Smeagol, which might surprise some of you. His real name in Western was Trahald, meaning borrowing, worming in, or apt to creep into a hole. His name Smeagol is a translation of that name into Old English. Smeagol spent the early years of his life living with his extended family under his grandmother's leadership. It was a wealthy family and of high repute. The most inquisitive and curious-minded of the family was Smeagol, who was interested in roots and beginnings. He dived into deep pools, he burrowed under trees and growing plants, he tunneled into green mounds, and he ceased to look up at the hilltops, or the leaves of the trees, or the flowers opening in the air. His head and his eyes were downward. Smeagol had some amount of education in law, as during his youth he had learned of the events concerning the War of the Last Alliance, based on what he says in the Dead Marshes to Sam and Frodo. Gollum also tells the hobbits that in his youth he and the other hobbits heard many stories about Gondu and their kings, but also about the Tower of the Moon and the stone inside the tower. But even in Smeagol's youth, the tower had been conquered by the Nazgul, that now ruled from the city that changed name from Minas Ethel to Minas Morgul. Playing the riddle game was also something Gollum enjoyed in his youth, which became evident with this famous game of riddles in the dark with Bilbo in The Hobbit. Around 2463, the One Ring would be found. It was Smeagol's birthday, and early in the morning, he and his friend and close relative, Deagle, went boating in the Gladden Fields, where there were great beds of iris and flowering reeds. Deagle was much like Smeagol, but sharper-eyed, and not so quick and strong. Normally when we talk about hobbits, they give out presents on their birthdays, but they could also receive them, as Tolkien explains in length in letter 214, a topic that deserves a video on its own. Deagle had given Smeagol a present before they set out, but Deagle was a mean little soul and grudged it. Smeagol was both meaner and greedier, however. There on the Gladden fields, they spent the morning. Smeagol got out and went nosing about the banks, but Deagle sat in the boat and fished. Suddenly a great fish took his hook, and before he knew where he was, he was dragged out and down into the water to the bottom. Then he let go of his line, for he thought he saw something shining in the riverbed, and holding his breath, he grabbed at it. Then up he came spluttering, with weeds in his hair and a handful of mud, and he swam to the bank, and behold, when he washed the mud away, there in his hand lay a beautiful golden ring, and it shone and glittered in the sun. But Smeagol had been watching him from behind a tree, and as Deagle gloated over the ring, Smeagol came softly up behind. Give us that, Deagle, my love, said Smeagol, over his friend's shoulder. Why? said Deagle. Because it's my birthday, my love, and I want it said Smeagol. The gift Deagle had given him earlier, he had found poor and insufficient. I don't care, said Deagle. I've given you a present already, more than I could afford. I found this, and I'm going to keep it. Oh, are you indeed, my love, said Smeagol, and he caught Deagle by the throat and strangled him, because the gold looked so bright and beautiful, and he put the ring on his finger and became the fourth ring bearer, after Saran, Isidur, and Deagle. No one ever found out what had become of Deagle. He was murdered far from home, and his body was cunningly hidden. But Smeagol returned alone, and he found that none of his family could see him when he was wearing the ring. He was very pleased with this discovery, and he concealed it, and he used it to find out secrets, and he put his knowledge to crooked and malicious uses. He became sharp-eyed and keen-eared for all that was hurtful. The ring had given him power, according to his stature, but was also slowly starting to corrupt his mind further. It is not to be wondered at, that he became very unpopular and was shunned by all his relations. They kicked him, and he bit their feet. He took to thieving, and going about muttering to himself, and gurgling in his throat. 
So they called him Gollum and cursed him, and told him to go far away. And his grandmother, desiring peace, expelled him from the family, and turned him out of her hole. He wandered in loneliness, weeping a little for the hardness of the world. And he journeyed up the river till he came to a stream that flowed down from the mountains, and he went that way. He caught fish into deep pools with invisible fingers, and ate them raw. One day it was very hot, and as he was bending over a pool, he felt a burning on the back of his head, and a dazzling light from the water pained his wet eyes. He wondered at it, but he had almost forgotten about the sun. Then for the last time, he looked up and shook his fist at her. He sought to flee from the sunlight, and saw the nearby misty mountains as the solution to his problems. He journeyed by night, up into the highlands, and he found a little cave out of which the dark stream ran, and he wormed his way like a maggot into the heart of the hills, and vanished out of all knowledge. The ring went into the shadows with him, and even the maker, when his power had begun to grow again, could learn nothing of it. And there in the gloom of Gollum's cave, the ring twisted his mind and hobbit body, and prolonged his life far beyond its natural limits. It was seven years since he had taken the ring from Deagle, but the murder of Deagle still haunted him, and he kept repeating to the ring, and himself, that it had come to him, that it was his birthday present, his precious. The ring extended Gollum's life by more than 400 years. He lived on a small island, surrounded by a subterranean lake. From his raft, he preyed upon any raw fish that he could, though sometimes he managed to catch goblins from the nearby goblin town. He grew such an absurd taste for food, that years later, he found Hobbit and Elven food repulsive. The ring took a deep toll on him, both physically and mentally. He became disfigured and grotesque in appearance, and by the time of the event in The Hobbit, he was afflicted with almost complete madness. In July 2941, the quest for Erebor had begun, and Thorin's company tried to cross the Misty Mountains. Bilbo got lost from the rest of the company, and stumbled upon Gollum's cave, and found the ring. The ring had abandoned Gollum in the network of caves leading to the lake. It had a will of its own, and wanted to return to its master. As Gandalf said later, the necromancer was becoming more powerful, and it was a good time for the ring to change hands, and get back to Sauron. Only two years before the event in The Hobbit, Sauron had sent out spies to the Gladden Fields, where the store hobbits had once lived, though none of them remained by then. The ring was picked up by the most unlikely person imaginable, Bilbo from the Shire. While Gollum was unaware of his loss, he met Bilbo Baggins, who was lost in the cave, and tried to find a way out. It is possible that Gollum's own part of his mind was pleased to hear again a kindly voice that reminded him of the outside world. That is at least what Gandalf seems to imply in The Lord of the Rings. But this also made Gollum's evil part angrier. After the famous riddle game, Gollum refused to show Bilbo the promised way out, and plotted to murder him. In fact, Gollum meant to cheat all the time. He was just trying to put poor Bilbo off his guard, and it amused his wickedness to start a game which might end in providing him with an easy victim, but if he lost, would not hurt him. But as we know, Gollum did lose the game, and when he went to get his birthday present, he found that it was gone. He suddenly realized the answer to Bilbo's last riddle, what have I got in my pocket, and became furious. Bilbo inadvertently stumbled across the ring's power of invisibility as he tried to get away, allowing him to follow Gollum to the entrance of the cave. There Bilbo at first thought to kill Gollum, but was overcome with pity, so he jumped over him to escape. As Bilbo ran, Gollum cried out, Thief! Thief, Baggins! We hate it forever! He hated the dark, and he hated light more. He hated everything, and the ring most of all. But his desire for it became too great. So three years later, in 2944, Gollum set out to hunt for the ring and look for the thief. His longing for the ring proved stronger than his fear of the orcs, or even the light. Though still bound by the sire of it, the ring was no longer devouring him. He began to revive a little. He felt old, terribly old, yet less timid, and he was mortally hungry. Still hating the sun, he cunningly found he could hide from daylight and moonshine, and make his way swiftly and softly by dead of night, with his pale cold eyes, and catch small frightened or unwary things. He grew stronger and bolder, with new food and new air. He found his way into Mirkwood, following the trail of Bilbo. It was hard to follow the trail, but at last Gollum found his way to Lake Town, that was being rebuilt after the death of Smaug. He even made his way to the streets of Dale, that too was being rebuilt that same year, by the newly crowned king, Bard. Here Gollum would listen to what the locals would say. The news of the great events went far and wide in Wilderland, and many had heard of Bilbo's name and knew where he came from. He had made no secret of his return journey to his home in the west. Gollum's sharp ears would soon learn what he wanted and know where to go. He went back west, planning to find Bilbo in the Shire, but then he turned aside. 
It is uncertain what exactly drew him away, but it was not the distance to the Shire that scared Gollum. Gandalf wanted to question Gollum and send hunters after him. The wood elves tracked him first, an easy task for them, for his trail was still fresh then. Through Mirkwood and back again it led them. Though they never caught him, the wood was full of rumour of him. Dreadful tales, even among beasts and birds. The woodman said that there was some new terror abroad, a ghost that drank blood. It climbed trees to find nests. It crept into holes to find the young. It slipped through windows to find cradles. At the western edge of Mirkwood, the trail turned away. It wandered off southwards and passed out of the Wood Elf's ken and was lost. Gandalf neglected the matter because he had much else to think at that time, which was a great mistake because it was the year when Sauron declared himself openly and Gollum turned towards Mordor. For many years he would wander around in the Wilderland and both see the Black Gate and find a way through both the Dead Marshes and Emin Muil. It was first around 2980 he found an alternative route into Mordor. He had dared to get close to Minas Morgul, he greatly feared, and had found a secret stair. He followed it and became acquainted with the terrifying spider Shelob. He bowed and worshipped her and promised to bring food to her, but her loss was not his loss. Little she knew of or cared for towers or rings or anything devised by mind or hand. She only wanted to feast and grow as big as possible until the mountains could hold her no longer. Ever since Saren had returned, it had become harder to find fresh meat. So she agreed to Gollum's promises and let him go. In 3001, after Bilbo's farewell party, Gandalf started to suspect that Bilbo's ring was one of the rings of power and so changed his plans. He needed to make sure he was right and left the ring in Frodo's protection in the Shire for the time being. At evening the following day, Gandalf departed, seeking for news of Gollum. Gandalf called on the help of Aragorn and asked that the rangers of the north doubled their guard on the Shire. Between 3004 to 3009, Gandalf starts to visit the Shire on a regular basis. In 3009, he renewed a search for Gollum along with Aragorn, but the trail was long cold when they started searching for him again. Gandalf's search would have been in vain if it hadn't been for Aragorn, who he would call the greatest traveller and huntsman of the Third Age. Together they searched for Gollum, down the whole length of Wilderland. They searched the Vales of Anduin, Mirkwood and Ravanian, to the confines of Mordor, but without hope and without success. We had rumour of Gollum, and we guessed that he dwelt there long in the dark hills, but we never found him, and at last I despaired, as Gandalf says at the Council of Elrond. At some time during these years, Gollum himself ventured into Mordu, and was captured by Saran and brought to barad where he was tortured for many years. He was forced to reveal what he knew about the ring, and thus Saran learned from him that the One Ring was found, and he heard about hobbits and the Shire. In the beginning of 3017, Gollum was released from Mordu, and tried to make his way north. Aragorn had searched for him at the Black Gate, and even in the Mogul Vale, but had given up and returned back north. But by fortune, Aragorn found the marks of Gollum's feet at the skirts of the Dead Marshes. They did not lead to Mordor, but away from it. So he followed the trail and caught Gollum by Eve. Gollum had no love for Aragorn and bit him, which just made the ranger treat him even worse. I deemed it the worst part of all my journey, the road back, watching him day and night, making him walk before me with a halter on his neck, gagged, until he was tamed by a lack of drink and food, driving him ever towards Mirkwood. I brought him there, at last, and gave him to the elves, but we had agreed that this should be done, and I was glad to be rid of his company, for he stank. For my part, I hope never to look upon him again. But Gandalf came, and endured long speech with him, as Aragorn tells at the Council of Elrond. According to Aragorn, Gollum was taken at nightfall on February 1st, Hoping to escape detection by any of Sauron's spies, he drove Gollum through the north end of the Emin Muil and crossed Anduin just above San Gebir. Driftwood was often cast up there on the shoals by the East Shore, and binding Gollum to a log, he swam across with him and continued his journey north by tracks as westerly as he could find through the skirts of Mirkwood, and so over Limlight, then over Nimrodil and Silverload, through the eaves of Lorien, and then on, voiding Moria and Dimuldale, over Glatton until he came near the Carrock. There he crossed Anduin again, with the help of the Beonings, and passed into the forest. The whole journey on foot was not short of 900 miles, and this Aragorn accomplished with weariness in 50 days, reaching Thranduil on the 21st of March. Two days later, Gandalf came to Thranduil and questioned Gollum. The wizard interrogated him, and among Gollum's growling, snorting, curses and lies, Gandalf endured many weary days, but also discovered a grain of truth in some of Gollum's lies. Gollum had claimed his grandmother had given the ring to him 
and that she had lots of beautiful things of that kind. A ridiculous story by Gandalf's account. He had no doubt that Smeagol's grandmother was a matriarch, a great person in her own way, but to talk of her possessing many elven rings was absurd to him. And as for giving them away, it was a lie. But a lie with a grain of truth. As Gandalf tells of Frodo, I endured him as long as I could, but the truth was desperately important, and in the end I had to be harsh. I put the fear of fire on him, and wronged the true story out of him, bit by bit, together with much snivelling and snarling. He thought he was misunderstood and ill-used, but when he had at last told me his history, as far as the end of the riddle game and Bilbo's escape, he would not see any more, except in dark hints. Some other fear was on him, greater than mine. He muttered that he was going to gill his own back. People would see if he would stand being kicked, and driven into a hole, and then robbed. Gollum had good friends now, good friends, and very strong. They would help him. Baggins would pay for it. That was his chief thought. He hated Bilbo, and cursed his name. What is more, he knew where he came from. Gandalf placed him in the care of the Sylvan Elves of the Woodland Realm. Thranduil and his people would watch over Gollum, and Legolas even seemed to have met him. Legolas was later sent to the Council of Elrond to report that Gollum had escaped. Alas, alas, cried Legolas, and in his fair elvish face there was great distress. The tidings that I was sent to bring must now be told. They are not good, but only here have I learned how evil they may seem to this company. Smeagol, who is now called Gollum, has escaped. Escaped, cried Aragorn. That is ill news indeed. We shall rue it bitterly, I fear. How come the folk of Thranduil to fail in their trust? Not through lack of watchfulness, said Legolas, but perhaps through overkindliness. We fear that the prisoner had ate from others, and that more is known of our doings that we could wish. We guarded this creature day and night at Gandalf's bidding, much though we wearied of the task. But Gandalf bade us hope still for his cure, and we had not the heart to keep him ever in dungeons under the earth, where he would fall back into his old black thoughts. You were less tender to me said glowing with a flash in his eyes as old memories were stirred of his imprisonment in the deep places of the elven king's halls. Now come, said Gandalf. Pray do not interrupt my good glowing. That was a regretful misunderstanding. Long said right. If all the grievances that stand between elves and dwarves are to be brought up here, we may as well abandon this council. Glowing rose and bowed, and Legolas continued. In the days of fair weather, we led Gollum through the woods, and there was a high tree standing alone, far from the others, which he liked to climb. Often we let him mount up to the highest branches, until he felt the free wind, but we set a guard at the tree's foot. One day he refused to come down, and the guards had no mind to climb after him. He had learned the trick of clinging to boughs with his feet, as well as with his hands, so they sat by the tree far into the night. It was that very night of summer, yet moonless and starless, that orcs came on us at unawares. We drove them off after some time. They were many and fierce, but they came from over the mountains and were unused to the woods. When the battle was over, we found that Gollum was gone and his guards were slain or taken. It didn't seem plain to us that the attack had been made for his rescue and that he knew of it beforehand. How that was contrived we cannot guess, but Gollum is cunning and the spies of the enemy are many. The dark things that were driven out in the year of the dragon's fall have returned in greater numbers and Mirkwood is again an evil place save where our realm is maintained. We have failed to recapture Gollum. We came on his trail among those of many orcs, and it plunged deep into the forest, going south. But ere long it escaped our skill, and we dared not continue the hunt, but we were drawing nigh to Dol Guldur, and that is still a very evil place. We do not go that way. Well, well, he is gone, said Gandalf. We have no time to seek for him again. He must do what he will, but he may play a part yet that neither he nor Sauron have foreseen. And as we all know, Gandalf would be right about that last assessment. It was in June that the orcs attacked the elves, which allowed Gollum to escape and continue his hunt for the ring, but his pursuers were still following him, and would not so easily give up. He headed east towards the Misty Mountains in August, and decided to hide in Moria, where his pursuers dared not follow him. He walked through Moria, and we can only speculate what horrors he might have seen there. He reached the west gate, but could not open the doors of Durin from the inside, and was trapped in Moria. There he was for months in the darkness, full of misery, and a relentless desire for the ring. On the 13th of January, the doors of Durin would open, and the fellowship entered Moria. He picked up their trail, and started to follow the new ring-bearer, Frodo Baggins. Two days later Gandalf fell, while fighting the Balrog, and the bridge of Khazad-dûm was broken. 
It is unknown how Gollum crossed the chasm, but he escaped the darkness of Moria and followed the Fellowship to Lothlorien. He was almost certain that he could hear stealthy movements at the trees furred far below. Not the hills, but woodland folk were altogether noiseless in their movements. Then he heard faintly a sound, like sniffing, and something seemed to be scrappling on the bark of the tree trunk. He stared down into the dark, holding his breath. Something was climbing slowly, and his breath came like a soft hissing through closed teeth. Then coming up, close to the stem, Frodo saw two pale eyes. They stopped, and gazed upward unwinking. Suddenly they turned away, and a shadow of figure slipped round the trunk of the tree and vanished. Immediately afterwards, Helia came climbing swiftly up through the branches. There was something in this tree that I have never seen before, he said. It was not an orc. It fled as soon as I touched the tree stem. It seemed to be wary and to have some skill in trees. I might have thought that it was one of you hobbits. I did not shoot. I dared not arouse any cries. We cannot risk battle. It was Gollum still tracking them through Lorien. After that he kept the distance to the elves, but still tracked the ringbearer. Hiding somewhere around the shores of Anduin, Gollum spied the fellowship departure from Lorien. As they sailed down the Anduin towards the forts of Arrows, Gollum followed their boats, floating on a log. I should make nothing of it, but a log in the dusk, and sleep in your eyes, Sam, said Frodo. If this was the first time that those eyes had been seen, but it isn't. I saw them away back north before we reached Lorien. I saw a strange creature with eyes climbing on the flat that night. I did saw it too. And do you remember the report of the elves that went after the orc band? Ah, said Sam. I do, and I remember more too. I don't like my thoughts, but thinking of one thing and another, and Mr. Bilbo's stories and all, I fancy I could put a name on the creature, and I guess, a nasty name. Gollum, maybe. Yes, that is what I have feared for some time, said Frodo. Ever since the night on the flat, I suppose he was lurking in Moria, and picked up our trail then, but I hoped our stay in Lorien would throw him off the scent again. The miserable creature must have been hiding in the woods by the silver load, watching us start off. That's about it, said Sam, and we'd better be a bit more watchful ourselves, or we'll feel some nasty fingers around our necks one of these nights, if we ever wake up to feel anything. Gollum would continue to track them, and after the breaking of the fellowship, he tracked Frodo and Sam as they tried to find their way through Imin Muil. After a confrontation, in which Gollum bit Sam's shoulder and nearly strangled him, Frodo subdued him with sting. He tied the elvish rope around Gollum's ankle for a leash, but the mere touch of the rope pained him. Taking pity on the wretched creature, Frodo made Gollum swear to help them and travel with them. Agreeing to the oath, Gollum swore by the precious itself, and Frodo released him. He proved a valuable guide through the dead marshes, and led them to the Black Gate of Mordor. Frodo's kindness brought out the better half of Gollum, this meagre personality, if you like, and he made at least some efforts to keep his promise. The two had a strange sort of bond, as they both knew the burden of the ring. In Gollum, Frodo saw his possible future, and so wanted to save him. Gollum also feared Frodo, and also thought that helping him would deprive Sauron of the ring. When the Black Gate was reached, and found to be well guarded, Gollum convinced them not to go that way, saying that they would be caught, and Sauron would regain the ring, which Gollum greatly feared. Gollum said he would lead them south, where he knew of another entrance into Mordor, though he would not say what danger awaited them there. They journeyed south through Ithilien, but Frodo and Sam were caught by Faramir and his rangers. Gollum followed them, but was caught in the forbidden pool beneath Heneth Anun. When Frodo allowed Faramir to briefly take Smeagol prisoner, however, he felt betrayed, and the darkness and Gollum came back. Faramir found out that the place Gollum was taking them was called Cerith Ungol. He warned Frodo and Sam of the evil of the place, but they did not know that a giant spider stood between them and Mordor. Frodo, Sam and Gollum left Faramir and his rangers, walked past the crossroads and entered the Mogul Vale. On March 11th, Gollum visited Sheila in her lair. He planned to betray the hobbits to her and then get the ring for himself, finally reunited with his precious. When he crawled back to the hobbits, they were asleep. The sight of Frodo sleeping nearly moved Gollum to repent. However, Sam woke up and spoke harshly to Gollum, and all hope of redemption was lost. He followed through with his plan and led Frodo and Sam into Shilop's lair, a Torek Ungol in Sindarin. To the orcs of Kirith Ungol, Gollum was known as a sneak, which seems to imply that they had worked together in the past when Gollum first encountered the hideous creature. Just as Frodo had warned him, breaking his oath would in the end lead to his own undoing. But Frodo and Sam escaped Shilop's lair. Frodo was freed from the tower of Kirith Ungol, and against all odds, they came to the volcano of Mount Doom at last. Gollum followed them all the way, 
seeking a chance to surprise attack them and take back the ring. Whatever dreadful paths, lonely and hungry and waterless, yet trodden, driven by a devouring desire and a terrible fear, he had left grievous marks on him. He was a lean, starved, haggard thing, all bones and tight-drawn sallow skin. A wild light flamed in his eyes, but his malice was no longer matched by his old gripping strength. As they climbed the volcano and almost reached Samoth Nawa, the one place the ring had once been forged, Gollum saw his chance. He attacked, but failed to get the ring. Sam, who had hated Gollum from the start, tried to bring himself to kill him, but relented out of sheer pity and disgust, turning his back on the beaten creature, and so pity spared Gollum's life yet again. Frodo was standing on the edge of the cracks of doom, but unwilling to destroy the ring, he claimed it for himself and put it on. Then Gollum attacked again in a last desperate attempt to get back his precious. The two fought whilst Frodo was invisible, and finally Gollum bit off Frodo's finger. At long last he had the ring in his hands again, after so many years, and after so much pain and misery. Gollum, dancing like a mad thing, held off the ring, a finger still thrust within its circle. It shone now, as if verily it was wrought of living fire. Precious, 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 cried Gollum. My precious, oh my precious. And with that, even as his eye were lifted up to gloat on his prize, he stepped too far, toppled, wavering for a moment on the brink, and then with a shriek he fell. Out of the depths came his last wail, precious, and he was gone. And so the pity shown to Gollum ultimately led to the destruction of the One Ring. Had Gollum not lived to play his final part, there would have been a good chance that Sauron would have regained the ring, as he knew where Frodo was as soon as he put on the ring. At the end, the evil in the ring was what led to its own destruction. But do you remember Gandalf's words? Even Gollum may have something yet to do. But for him, Sam, I could not have destroyed the ring. The quest would have been in vain, even at the bitter end. So let us forgive him, but the quest is achieved, and now all is over. I am glad you are here with me. You are at the end of all things, Sam. And here ends today's tale about the life of Gollum. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider leaving a like. It truly makes a difference and helps the video reach even more people. If you are new to the channel, please consider subscribing. There are many videos like this as well. Feel free to check them out. Special thanks to all the YouTube members and patrons supporting the channel. Your support makes it possible to order cool artworks like the one with Gollum used in this video. As always, thank you all for watching and being part of the Council of the Rings. Farewell till next time.